So, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? We get out of extreme rules, we think the grass is greener on the other side, right? Finally, we get to go to something that we're going to give a fuck about and that WWE will give a fuck about, SummerSlam. We are finally out of extreme rules, we're headed towards SummerSlam, but, big but here... The more things change, the more they stay the same. Because if you thought I was confused before Extreme Rules because of that bullshit card for Extreme Rules, I'm even more confused as I sit here this morning with you guys after last night's Monday Night Raw, the first Monday Night Raw on the road to SummerSlam, and I am just as confused as one top superstar confesses their love to another top superstar, and we have two triple threats with most of the superstars not even deserving of an opportunity at the championship realistically. Yet, that's all what transpired last night. Now, before I get to all that nonsensical bullshit and confusing crap from last night, I want to start off with something positive. It feels with this whole Extreme Rules bullshit, I haven't really talked about anything positive in a couple of weeks, and that pisses me off. Because that shows you how bad Extreme Rules, the build and the event has been. Last night, I got one good segment from Monday Night Raw. Yes, there was some good wrestling here and there, but not enough to make me step back and say, that's a great fucking Raw, or that's some really good wrestling. No, because the story wasn't there to back it up. But one segment that I'm going to remember from last night... That was the one superstar that is captivating me in WWE right now. And her, that's right, I said her name is Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey right now is being built up like a half Brock Lesnar, half Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's how they're booking her. That's what they're doing creatively with her. And I think it is fucking brilliant. And that goes to show you, WWE isn't as dumb as we think they are when it comes to building superstars. No, no, no. They know how to do it. It just seems for some reason they don't want to build who we think should be at the top. Or they want to extra build the ones they think are going to catapult their company, aka Total Divas Superstars, outside of the WWE bubble, get that name recognition. But from an industry standpoint... Wouldn't your top superstars do the same thing if you let them go into the ring, do what they're best at, and captivate the pro wrestling audience first? Then that'll trickle outside of the WWE bubble. Like Daniel Bryan, you didn't want to give him a chance at all. We finally made you give him a chance. And that yes movement was in every arena that wasn't a pro wrestling ring, by the way. Everybody was doing the yes chant from college football games to National Basketball Association games, Major League Baseball, NFL, boxing, skiing tournaments, or whatever the fuck you, can you, is it a skiing a tournament? Skiing events, golf, everybody was doing the yes, high schools across the fucking world. And it all started with just a wrestler that you didn't even want to give a time, the time of day to. So the formula is simple. Let the WWE audience inform you on who we think should be at the top. Give them the top spot in the time of day. See if they flourish. And if we were correct, then that'll trickle outside of the WD, WW, WWE bubble. I can speak. And everybody wins. Instead, WWE's formula the past 15 years, we're going to try to fucking manufacture a, ta a top star. Now that doesn't mean they can't build a top star, but you can't manufacture it. That's not going to happen. Building means you're giving them the right booking and giving them the right creative input to go out there and utilize. We ultimately have to decide as the fan if it's going to work or if it's not. That's on us. So to build a WWE superstar, it takes both of us. It takes the WWE machine and the audience. When they try to manufacture a superstar... Case in point, Roman Reigns, it'll fall on its face every time. It's just a fact. We've seen it time and time again. We saw when they were trying to put the strap on Batista when we wanted Daniel Bryan. 
We saw it again when they tried to put it on Roman Reigns. We wanted anybody but Roman Reigns at that point. There was a couple of superstars. We wanted it specifically, like Seth Rollins, for instance. But time and time again, I can give you examples of when they tried to manufacture and when we just said, no, this person should be it. Ronda Rousey is getting the right booking. This is a... It's such a, a crazy situation because you can tell they want to manufacture Ronda as the top star, but they finally... See, I was about to say they got smart and they're booking her correctly, but I think they always knew the formula. They just don't want to give in to us, the fans. But for Ronda Rousey, they really don't want to fuck this up. And they're booking her the right fucking way. And the only way to book her is half Brock, half Stone Cold. And what I mean by that is over a month ago when she got suspended like Brock Lesnar did by beating everybody up in her way. Not only superstars, but referees and suits and ties. Security, who the fuck cares? Ronda takes them all out. She gets suspended. That's Brock Lesnar-esque. I like that. Last night, she comes through the crowd while still suspended. How badass is that? That's Stone Cold-esque. Showing up when you're A, uninvited, and B, when you're not allowed to. That brings this sense of chaos when you're coming through the crowd anyway. That's what made the Shield extra big, right? That's what made us like the Shield even more. They were coming through the crowd. It was unconventional. You don't really see people come through the crowd because that's admitting you don't like the boys. You're not one of them. You're not here to play. You're here to fuck shit up when you come through the crowd. But for Ronda, there was even more spice in the recipe because she wasn't allowed to be there. She was still suspended. And then she gets in there. She, first of all, flies like a chick. I always said there's only one specimen, one fucking uh, human, one entity, one monster that's faster than a cheetah. And that's Braun Strowman. But last night, Ronda Rousey was in that league because Mickey... And Alexa tried to haul ass up the rampway when they saw Ronda coming through the crowd. But in the background, you see Ronda fly through the crowd and hop up the fucking rampway, the, the, the staging area. She just jumped up on it like it's a jumping jack. That's how athletic this woman is. And she cuts off Alexa and Mickey. And Alexa and Mickey now try to haul ass the other way back toward the ring. And Ronda Rousey flies into the ring. Catches Mickey James, flatlines Mickey James, grabs her arm for the arm bar. Alexa's able to, to pull her out. So at this point, there's enough referees to keep Ronda in the ring and enough referees to usher Alexa and Mickey James up the rampway. But Ronda Rousey, in typical Stone Cold uh, fashion and format, says, Fuck that shit. I ain't done. I'm causing more chaos. We thought it was done there, especially for the women. They usually don't try to go all out for the women, right? They had their spat. Mickey James got beat up a little. Referees and suits and ties are breaking it up. That's it. But no, they went the extra mile with Ronda. Ronda slips underneath the bottom rope and she starts hauling ass up the rampway. She's got this look on her face like she don't know what she's going to do when she gets there, but she just knows everyone's getting fucked up. And she leaps over the referees to try to get to Alexa Bliss and Mickey. Everybody ends up crashing to the floor. Crashing on the ramp. Ronda flies and brings everybody down. More referees are trying to break it up. It's a chaotic situation in, a, in the right way. This is the right way to do chaos. And that is how you build Ronda Rousey. Eventually, Kurt Angle had to come out and say, Listen, Ronda, if you leave right now, you get a championship title match at SummerSlam with Alexa Bliss. If you keep this up, I have to prolong your suspension. As of right now, because you came back, while you sh still sh should have been on suspension, you're suspended for one more week as it is. Don't make it any longer. This brings out constipated Corbin. Corbin's like, one week is not good enough, Kurt. She just violated her suspension. I'm going to call Stephanie McMahon, but he can't find his phone. So he goes in the back to look for his phone. Kurt Angle's like, he's looking for this. So Kurt Angle took his phone so he couldn't call Stephanie, which Stephanie didn't have any say. Kurt Angle had the final say, obviously. And that is that Ronda Rousey will challenge Alexa Bliss for that raw strap at SummerSlam. 
And if, if Ronda Rousey doesn't get that strap in Brooklyn, I, I don't, I'm don't. i setting up 10 concrete walls, and I'm not even going one by one. I'm literally getting so much velocity that I'm going through the first concrete wall, and I'm not stopping until I reach the last concrete wall head first. Because that, I don't know what to say at that point. Put the strap on fucking Ronda Rousey at this point, man. There's no way Alexa Bliss, even with the help of the whole roster, is going to take out Ronda Rousey. Not happening. Ronda Rousey is the one moment on Raw, the one segment, the one character on Raw that captivated me last night. The one thing that I'm going to remember from Raw last night was no triple threat tag match or somebody confessing love. No, it was Ronda Rousey's badass segment. Is that so hard to do, WWE? Just have some fun, get creative, get, get have some fucking entertaining segments? It's clear you can do it. You play dumb, but it's clear after last night, you know how to build a star. You know what the fuck you're doing. You know how to have intriguing, creative segments. Why do you not do it more often? Everything is so robotic in WWE on these shows. It's like there's no pulse on these shows. Everything is just going through the motions. Interview. Wrestling match. Another wrestling match. Interview. Wrestling match. Dissension. GM. This will be a tag match. Tag match is instated. Tag match is over. Another match. Interview. Match. Raw's over. Where is the fun, intriguing stories being told? Why are we not in the parking lot more? Backstage more? Behind the scenes more? In the crowd more? Stories should be being told. Everything is just in the ring. All the interviews just in the ring or a one minute backstage interview segment. No stories are being told. Ronda Rousey is the only story I'm interested in right now. It really is. And it's with fucking Alexa Bliss. Who would have thought? But they're building her up to be that rebel fucking character. I love that shit. Just a legit badass. That's Ronda Rousey right now, man. That's the positive on the show. So if you came to this channel and this review for just some positive energy right on this show, this is where the video ends for you. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you tomorrow hopefully for SmackDown's review reaction. If you're willing to stick around for the amplified truth about the bullshit last night, well that starts right now. And let's keep it with the women. Let's start with Sasha fucking Banks confessing her love to Bailey. That's right, one of the best wrestlers we've ever seen in WWE, ever. While one superstar is badass and going for the strap in Ronda Rousey, Sasha Banks is confessing her love to Bailey. Can't make that shit up. It starts with Kurt Angle's obsession to get Bailey and Sasha to work with each other. So after seeing that badass brawl that they did several weeks ago, and then watching that awesome epic segment that we thought finally we're getting that real, that real thrill that we were seeking in this story between Bailey and Sasha. And then the next two weeks they're just in counseling in some awkward Sesame Street tit for tat hooting and hollering at each other like two ten year olds. That's what the counseling two weeks were. So that hot angle that they had going was cold as ice by the end of last week. And, that, and just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, well, last night happened. And Kurt Angle kept up his obsession with pitting Bailey and Sasha together as a team and having them work well together and having them get along. Storyline-wise, why does creative find Kurt Angle's character so, so obsessed with trying to get Sasha and Bailey to work with each other? Why wasn't he like that with Roman and Braun? Roman and Braun hated each other. We're beating the fuck out of each other every week. Kurt wasn't trying to put him in tag teams. Kurt Angle is obsessed with getting people to work with each other, right? Bobby Lashley and Roman Re Reigns for weeks against the Revival. Bailey and Sasha, why does everyone have to get along? It's pro wrestling! You gotta piss people off to get ahead. Make the enemies to get ahead. Kurt Angle is trying to be everybody's father ever since he found out he was Jason Jordan's father. It's bullshit. Storyline-wise, anyway, I don't understand it. 
So, then you go on to the tag team match. Now, we have Bailey and Sasha. Again, I, I just remember, just weeks ago, they were in this awesome brawl. And we finally thought the story was getting good. And now it's right back where it started. They're back as a tag team. And we don't know if they're going to be good together or if they're going to fucking uh, have a fucking little argument. A, a little spit spat. Like two ten-year-olds. We don't know what's going to happen. Oh, shit. Got to find out what's going to happen at kindergarten today. And the match lasts about four minutes with uh, Alicia Fox and Dana Brooke because it's Alicia Fox and Dana Brooke. And at one point, they double-team Bailey on the outside. And Sasha Banks is like, no, nah, that's my fucking lover. Get away from her. And Sasha Banks goes in some lover's rage and then walks to the back. So the referee calls for the bell. I don't know if it was a count-out, disqualification. I don't even give a fuck. Backstage... Sasha Banks goes to leave. Bailey stops her and goes, hey, you saved me. Does that mean you care? And Sasha Banks, I can't make this shit up. Sasha Banks, one of the best fucking wrestlers I've ever seen in the world, ever. And after just seeing how badass Ronda Rousey was in that ring uh, a couple segments earlier, and then Ronda Rousey fucking, or maybe it was after, who the fuck knows. But seeing Ronda Rousey, knowing she's going for the strap, and then to witness Sasha Banks and how fall, how fall, Far, she has fallen from grace. It's painful to watch what they're doing with Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks looks in Bailey's eyes and goes, Don't you get it? I love the way kids look up to you. I love the way that you care about everybody. I love the way you're always smiling. I love your outfits. I love your eyes and I love the way that you grow your flowers at home. Or whatever the fuck she was saying. I love the way you bake cupcakes. I love the way how you sprinkle peppers on your pizza. I don't know. She loves everything about Bailey is what she's saying. She's infatuated with Bailey, supposedly. And at the end she says, Don't you get it? I love you. I always have. I always will. And she storms off. Almost in tears. Confessing her love to Bailey. And we're all confused as fuck. Most of us thought this is the beginning of what? A lesbian storyline? Some other people on the internet are like, Oh, come on. Like, stop being immature. She's just showing her feelings. I gotta be honest, I'm with those people online. I thought this was like some lesbian shit. What does this mean? What do you confess? What the fuck? And on top of that, even if it's not a lesbian storyline and it's just Sasha saying, I love you, Bailey. I always have, I always will. I'm so in love with you. And showing her feelings, as you say. I don't want that segment on Monday Night Raw. What the fuck is going on? The fact that you you guys would be okay with these feelings coming out, right? These feelings. The fact that you would like that says a lot about today's product and today's fan. Honestly, because I saw that online last night. Mostly from women, mind you. I mean, not a lot of guys going, well, Sasha came out with her feelings. So cool. A lot of women were just like, I love this. Sasha finally coming out with her feelings and telling Bailey how she really feels about her. I love these two. How I, I just I, I don't get how some women view pro wrestling. I, I honestly think some women would like like a flower garden around the ring, you know what I mean? And like after the match they shake hands and they eat a cupcake together, and all of a sudden, instead of LED lighting and fireworks, a rainbow comes over and everyone's like, what? <laughs> this is okay. I love pro wrestling. Now this is where I'm supposed to say. Uh, PC, nothing against gays and lesbians, and that's fucking obvious. You guys know me by now. If there's any discrimination around me, I slap the fuck out of you. Treat everybody with respect and dignity. And zero problem with fucking gay people and lesbian people. Absolutely zero. Do your thing and do it 110%. My thing is, on WWE television with somebody like Sasha Banks, who should be going for straps... Okay, okay, maybe I shouldn't be saying that in, in this... She should be going for championships at this point. <laughs> I just did that joke. Um, Sasha should be going for championships. And she's over here confessing love to Bailey. I don't care if this is a lesbian storyline. If this is eventually Sasha and Bailey forming a tag team for the tag team championships that are coming soon. Because that's another thing that could, could be... Bailey and Sasha form a tag team and they're going to become the first tag team champions. Woohoo! Wow! Well, what does that do for fucking me? Sasha Banks should
should be heavyweight champion for the women on Raw and Smack. She should hold both championships. So a tag team championship on her isn't going to do anything with me. And now she's stuck with Bailey for the next year if she wins a tag strap? I don't want to see it. Or, or does this lead to a match eventually, finally? Do they, Next week they end up beating each other up again. Because every week it's something fucking stupid. Flip flop 50-50. And does this lead to a mid-card SummerSlam match? Because that's the best they're going to get is a mid-card SummerSlam match. There's no strap on the line. Vince isn't going to give them the 7-8-9 spot on the card. They're going to be in the third, fourth, fifth match at best. So either scenario, this is stupid. A lesbian storyline? Stupid. A tag team with Bailey? Stupid. A mid-card SummerSlam match? Stupid. No heat anymore. You turned what could have been epic heat when they were brawling a few weeks ago. You turned that to ice cold. There's no getting that back at, back now. I am 100% done with Sasha and Bailey. I'm sick of being fucking strung along. I, I feel like when, when two people get married and they put the cans behind their car and, and there's a sign in the back that says just married and they, they ride away the limousine or the car and all these cans are like flapping on the back. I feel like one of those cans and I'm just going for a ride. The car keeps riding, the married couple's riding away and I'm fucking like at the can just fucking bouncing on the fucking road all the way 97 miles to get to our destination, our honeymoon destination. I feel like a can that's just been going for a ride this whole time and being a fucking tool. Because I honestly thought for months they're going somewhere with Sasha and Bailey, But now, they're not. Or if they are, it's the dumbest fucking place they could have went with them. I'm done. The confessing of her love to Bailey is stupid. For somebody like Sasha fucking Banks who deserves so much fucking more. It's pathetic. Is what it is. Unfucking real. Stick with the women. Ember Moon. Ember Moon was undefeated. One-on-one -on -one matches for WWE, wasn't she? Not anymore. She lost. Guess who it was? Sarah fucking Logan beat her. Yes. Ember Moon gets called up as a phenomenal talent in NXT. One of the best former NXT champion for the women. She gets called up to the main roster and they had nothing for her. They just called her up. She's never been in one one-on-one -on -one storyline, epic storyline for a pay-per-view. Two, she's never, ever... Or, or no, I already said... <laughs> I won't even go there, man. She wasn't even a fucking a focal point in Money in the Bank. Let's be honest. But I'm not even going to fucking go there because that's, that Money in the Bank was a whole schmoz in itself. So let's just stick with she's never been in a storyline... Since she's been on the main roster. She has not... She was kept off, I should say, Extreme Rules. So not even a part of Extreme Rules. No, no kickoff show, no nothing. And then she's being pinned by Sarah fucking Logan. So no storylines. Kept off of Extreme Rules. And pinned by Sarah Logan. That's your Ember Moon. That's how you show the casual fan. She's somebody. She's gonna be big. Don't worry, fans. You can cheer for her because she's a great superstar. That's one way to show the casual fans. Dumb as fuck! Ember Moon continues a nosedive into the ground in obscurity. Just like Bobby Roode last night. Who confronted Dolph Ziggler and said, I want a shot at the IC strap. And Dolph Ziggler's like, no. But I'll give you a match, but not for the title. So they wrestle, and you think Bobby Roode's going to beat Dolph, and he's going to become the number one contender. At least they're doing something with Bobby Roode, right? Because this guy's been in obscurity for the past several months, it seems like. So they're doing something with Bobby Roode. This is good. And Bobby Roode, Dolph Ziggler would be the next natural progression for the IC strap. But Bobby Roode just loses clean in the middle of the ring. Now, on one hand, you're saying, okay, Dolph just walked away and ended the pay-per-view Sunday night. So now he's already losing the fucking Bobby Roode? Makes zero sense and it's stupid as fuck. On the other hand, Bobby Roode losing clean one, two, three in the middle of the ring. No trickery or cheatery. That's also dumb as fuck. Now this isn't one of those BC. Nothing makes you happy then. If Dolph loses, you're, you're, you're pissed. If, if Bobby Roode loses, you're pissed. There's a way to do it, guys. There's ways to go around. If you're creative... There's a way to tell the story you want to tell, Dolph and Bobby Roode, but at the end of it, everybody wins. There's ways to do it, and there's many ways, guys. You've heard me book before. 
There's a way I could have gotten out of that match with Dolph looking like a fucking, uh, the guy who ended the pay-per-view, right? A main eventer, even though Dolph is not that right now because they haven't booked him as such. But there's a way you can make him look like a main eventer after that segment with Bobby Roode, after that match. And there's also a way that Bobby Roode saves face. And he looks like a true viable contender for that IC strap even after that match. There's ways to do it. They just stop caring. And they're just like, ah, Bobby Roode's a clown anyway. Let's have him eat the one, two, three in the middle of the ring. No, nah, we don't need interference. We don't need any, th any uh, fucking uh, bells and whistles. Let's just have him lose. I think they bank on the fact that they're hoping that a lot of the fans don't remember that because every week it's either the same match or they're going so fucking chaotic in their storytelling that nobody even fucking re either remembers or they're just confused. That's most of the wrestling audience. I think that's what Vince McMahon and WWE is hoping on. That you forget that people like Bobby Roode are just losing these type of matches. But then there's smart fans like myself that don't forget that shit. We remember it. Because we watch, we suspend that reality and we want to believe in the story being told. So to do that, we keep track of everything. For people that say it's just a TV show, well, in your TV show, the TV show King of Queens, if Carrie kills Doug in his sleep, and then the next week Doug is on the next show, well, that doesn't make sense. So why the fuck would I believe something that doesn't make sense in WWE if it's just a TV show? No, it has to make sense. Bobby Roode and Ember Moon looking like clowns like Asuka is over on SmackDown. Who the fuck knows, man? But that wasn't it. That was just the women. Then we move on to the men. And the number one contender for Brock Lesnar's Universal Championship at SummerSlam. How do we do this? Two fucking triple threats. Woohoo! No way to get more creative than just throwing schmoz matches together. So this is... <laughs> Kurt Angle says, in order to, I don't even know where to begin. It's just so stupid, man. He's about to strip Brock Lesnar of the, the, the championship. Paul Heyman comes out and says, no, 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 hold on. They, they have a, a spit for spat that I could give two shits about. And Paul Heyman just comes to the conclusion, okay, you drive a hard bargain. Brock will be at SummerSlam. That's it. Then all of a sudden, wrestlers just start coming down. Very creative. We haven't seen this before. Kurt Angle's gonna name a fucking somebody to face Brock Lesnar and everybody comes down and somehow, if you just come to the ring, you will get a championship opportunity. I, I, this is so redundant. So fucking redundant. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen this. Everybody comes down, man. Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, Bobby Lashley, Elias, Finn Balor... Even Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre hasn't even had a fucking singles match, has he? <laughs> I'm like, what am, half of these guys, I'm like, what? Kurt is not going to put you in, right? I mean, you know he is, though, because this is where this is leading. But you're not actually going to get a chance, right? And that's what Kurt Angle did. He, he said two triple threat matches, and the winners will take on each other next week. And the winner of that match will go on to face Brock. But... The people in these triple threats, how do they get a chance, is my question. If you look at it, Drew McIntyre, at Extreme Rules, your pay-per-view, he was just helping Dolph Ziggler win an IC strap. Drew McIntyre on the main roster has done nothing, nothing at all, to get even a chance at the championship. But now, we all want to see Drew McIntyre eventually get those opportunities, absolutely. We all like Drew. But he's done nothing yet to get even a chance. And he's already fighting for the... Ch he's already in a triple threat. And if he wins that, he's just got to win one more match. And he's in the, the heavyweight championship, the universal championship match. It doesn't make sense for someone like me. If it does for you, that is awesome. You can just sit back and watch. That's awesome for you. I can't. I, the powers that be up above put a brain in my skull. That is awesome, right? I know. But the downside is... I actually give a shit about what I'm watching. That's the downside about having a brain in your skull. So, Drew McIntyre, it just makes you scratch your head. And then what boggles my mind is they also put 
uh, Seth Rollins in this thing. Now, we all want to see Seth Rollins succeed and be in those spots. But storyline-wise, you just had him lose one, two, three, center of the ring at your big pay-per-view against Dolph for the IC strap. So, realistically, for the Amplify, man, again, stupid me, I guess. I actually fucking go back and, and, and look at the story from the beginning. They Seth Rollins couldn't even pick up the IC strap. So his reward, his reward for losing the match to just try to get the mid-card title, his reward for that by losing the mid-card title match is a chance at the Universal, the higher belt. Well, fuck, if that's the case, everybody should just try to lose those matches for the IC strap. Dolph Ziggler gets penalized for being a champion. He can't even go for the Universal. Seth Rollins loses the match, he gets the chance. Makes sense, doesn't it, guys? I love just sitting back and being entertained by the, the, the shit that they feed us. It's great. Next week, I heard they're going to do a huge banana versus a jello match. This will be fun. Yes, it will. WWE said it's going to be fun. So Seth's in there somehow. And I'm like, oh, I, I like Seth, but how do, how do he just like, that's not the story. He's not, how to fuck? Um, uh, Elias, Elias, not even on the pay-per-view, right? I, I don't recall him on Extreme Rules at all. Next thing I know, he's getting a chant at the Universal Championship. Braun Strowman isn't even on that shit. So winning money in the bank, you get penalized. Well, Renee had an interview last night. Renee basically summed it up, actually. She asked Braun, why didn't you come out and declare your, your spot in the, in the, uh, for Brock Lesnar? And that's basically what it is. She exposed Kurt Angle. She exposed WWE's booking. She basically said, all you have to do is come to the ring and you are in, you get a chance at the Universal Championship. And Braun's like, because I got this. And he brings up his lunchbox, you know. And I'm just like, st I'm thinking in my head, what is in that lunchbox? Is it peanut butter and jelly? Is it a tuna fish? Is he an old school ham and cheese type guy? If he is, does he put mayonnaise on it? You know what I mean? Like, I'm wondering what's in that lunchbox. You know he's got his juice box because Mama Braun, Mama Strowman, never lets Braun leave the house without his juice box, his little Capri Suns. And what's his snack? Does he go like crackers or is he more like a chocolate chip cookie guy? So he holds up his little briefcase lunchbox and I'm just, all this shit's going through my head. That's more intriguing to, to me than the fucking promo going on backstage. Anyway, Braun's not in this, but Elias somehow is. Again, just like Seth and Drew, we like Elias. But storyline wise, realistically, how does he get a chance at the Universal Championship just like that. Just for coming to the ring. Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns just lost an exhibition match. No title was on the line. No stipulation. This was just an exhibition. Bobby Lashley versus Roman Reigns at Extreme Rules. Roman Reigns ate the L clean on his back. Flat on his back. Clean. One, two, three. Roman Reigns has to now go back a little bit in line, right? Bobby Lashley deserves to be out there, absolutely. That was a huge match against one of their top stars. Bobby Lashley wins. Roman Reigns comes to the ring. Just like that, that loss meant shit. Roman Reigns is now gets another chance at the Universal Championship. He just lost his Extreme Rules match. Some people would say, B-B-B-B-C. b b b b b b b b b c I like that. BC, Roman actually won that Greatest Royal Rumble ever match because his feet touched for some shit. So actually, he does get his rematch, BC, so it, does, but it doesn't fucking matter. It does not matter. What have you done for me? He just lost against Bobby Lashley. He came out, he looks in Kurt's eyes, and he admits, I have no excuses, I just want to take on someone tonight. And Kurt just throws him into a chance at the Universal Championship. All of these names... Bobby Lashley and Finn Balor at least won their Extreme Rules matches, so you can believe that. Believe that. Playa? This is from Roman Reigns and Teddy Long. So, right off the gate, guys, you know what? And if you think I'm nitpicking, excuse me for caring too much about the story being told. But again, I, I, I look at the whole story as a whole. 
I don't just forget what happens last week or three weeks ago or three months ago. I remember everything because it goes into a story. I'm not going to be one of those sheep that just fucking, they feed the fucking, they feed the grass to and go, hey, or go with everyone else. Go with the rest of the fucking cattle. Nope, not going to happen, man. I beat to my own drum. So the two triple threat matches happened. Now they were decent. The second one, which was the main event, took a long time to unfold. Um, but the final five to six minutes picked up. The crowd was more into it. I'll get to that in one minute. The first triple threat match started off raw. That was Roman Reigns, Drew McIntyre, Finn Balor. This was the match of the night. No question about it. I'll fully admit that, man. By the end of this match, Roman Reigns was busted open with a cut over his eye. Uh, Bobby Lashley, uh, not Bobby Lashley, Drew McIntyre flew at one point. At, you had Balor and Roman on the outside. Drew McIntyre does this fucking, he literally, man, looking like a, maybe not looking like a cruiserweight. It was a little sloppy, but for a guy over six foot like that with his stature, he hits the ropes and he comes flying, soaring, flipping over the rope onto Roman and Finn. For a guy like Drew McIntyre who doesn't need to add that to his arsenal, that just shows you why we like Drew McIntyre. He's willing to go the extra mile. He's willing to take those risks and those chances that I'm always talking about. Really cool to see McIntyre bust his ass in there. Really cool to see Roman. Again, again, never said I hated Roman, guys. I hate the way he's being booked. I always give Roman his, his due. I give credit where it's due, and it's been due with Roman the past couple of nights. Extreme Rules, he has another good pay-per-view match. Bra uh, Roman Reigns is a good brawl-style wrestler, and he has good matches. I liked his match at Sunday's Extreme Rules. Thought it was the match of the night over AJ and Rusev. And I felt like last night, Roman Reigns brought it again. And Finn Balor was electric last night. Finn Balor was the old-school Finn Balor, like when he first got to the roster, man. That's the Finn Balor you want to see. That was the match of the night. No question. I just don't like what it was for. Um, a schmaz to get to another match just to get to the person who's going to take on Brock Lesnar for the United Universal Championship. I don't like what it was for. But the match, obviously match of the night. The second triple threat ended Monday Night Raw. And it probably shouldn't have because it did not live up to any expectation. And this was Seth Rollins... Bobby Lashley and Elias. This match dragged for the first 7 to 10 minutes especially. The last 5 to 6 minutes picked up a little bit. Um, when this thing was all said and done, Bobby Lashley wins this match. And he keeps his momentum going. That's good to see. He has such momentum coming out of Extreme Rules. It would, you would hate to see that just lost last night. But we fade to black and go off the air with just Bobby Lashley winning his match. You know... I, Something more, maybe Roman Reigns hitting the, the rampway and just staring down at Bobby like you got me Sunday, but look how the stars have aligned. I get another shot at you next Monday night, and this time there's even more on the line. And you have that stare down, and then we can fade the black. Little things like that make it so much more entertaining and make a simplistic fade to black ending that nobody gives a shit about, it makes it a cliffhanger. Why not give us a cliffhanger? Now you may say, BC, not too many people are going to be excited for Roman and Bobby Lashley anyway. That's it. No, if you give me that one little thing, I'm at least a little more intrigued to see it. There's a little more on the line, man. The animosity is still there. Because without that, we just have this tournament style. I know it's a mini tournament, right? Two triple threats, and then the two winners take on each other the next week, and then that winner goes on to take on Brock. So you have this mini tournament. And with that, there's no real heated storyline. There's no animosity. There's no tension and dissension between two people, two individuals. That's what I don't like about Brock Lesnar, the way they book Brock Lesnar's matches. There's no heat. There's always just, we have to find out who a contender is for him. And all that does is it leads to a tournament style. You find the, the, the last remaining survivor of the tournament... And he goes on to face Brock. And then the final week or two, maybe there's a, a little feud. I like when championships actually have a feud from the beginning. No tournaments to find the number one contender. We already have a name and there's already turmoil. But with Brock only doing one or two fucking dates, this time it looks like he won't even show up before SummerSlam. All of the, the storyline has to be without Brock even in it. 
I hope this makes sense, man. I just felt like these two triple threat matches are just bogus. I've seen this so many times. Next week we go... That, so for Bobby Lashley, he gets screwed. Bobby Lashley has this huge win at Extreme Rules. Nothing on the line, but it's a big win. And then here we are, already this upcoming Monday. Roman is already going to most likely top Bobby Lashley. And this time, even more was on the line. Bobby Lashley gets screwed here. I beat Roman, and now I gotta face him again. And this time, if I lose, I lose everything and Roman gains everything. What it's probably gonna be, guys, is a triple threat. Roman, Bobby, and Brock at SummerSlam. And at the end of it, Braun Strowman is most likely going to be the one walking out with the championship. That's just what I think. We'll see, man. It'll all unfold next Monday. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming with the confusion here, with the nonsensical bullshit. All of this tournament style to get another number one contender. It's redundant. It's been done before. I'm sick of it. Um... Sasha Banks confessing her love. It's confusing, but it's also awkward, and it's bullshit for somebody like Sasha. Um, Bobby Roode, they just have nothing for. Ember Moon looks like a clown. Ember Moon is the Asuka of Monday Night Raw. Two phenomenal NXT women talents, totally destroyed on the main roster. And, and the only thing they got right last night was Ronda fucking Rousey. Her booking is phenomenal. Her character is badass. She's going for that strap at SummerSlam, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but so far, the SummerSlam card, the only match I'm looking forward to so far that's been fucking announced, or that we know of, we think is going to happen at SummerSlam, the only one I'm looking forward to, I can't believe I'm saying this because Alexa Bliss is in the match, but it's the Ronda Rousey match, because she has to take that strap off of Alexa in Brooklyn, man. Uh, please, let's try, try our very best to get this women's division back on track. Piece together the puzzle. Because right now, aside from Ronda Rousey, this women's division is way off track. If you're not part of a total divas past, present, or future, then you're non-existent to WWE. And that's bullshit. This women's division has to get back on track. Ronda Rousey is the right female to do that. I'm hoping so anyway. Amplified, man. I'm cashing the fuck out. I'm getting the fuck out of here, man. Coffee's and ass whippings. I'll see you guys tomorrow for SmackDown's review and reaction. Amplified, man. And I'll check you later.